Hi there, and welcome to this talk. <clears throat> um, this is Michael, Seismic Radio, and uh, this talk is about the rupture. And I've uh, I looked at the talks I'd done previously. There's a, a lot of talk about this uh, from my end, but uh, the reason why I'm doing this talk is I, I feel an urgency in my spirit that it's important to to get this out. And uh, <clears throat> I was stirred a little bit in my spirit where, where people said that, uh, let me just go to this page here, where people said that um, the rapture is a doctrine which was in introduced by this man here, by John Nelson Darby, in about 1830, <clears throat> so when he started his, his ministry. Now, I don't know that much about John Nelson Darby. I know he's got a Bible translation, and I think I've got one of his Bible translations somewhere. He also um, produced a translation. I'm not sure whether he did it himself uh, in German, which is the Elberfelder Bible or Elberfelder Bibel. Now, I'm German, and um, for me, the reference Bible is the Elberfelder from 18... Uh, 1800s when when it came when it first came out, and uh, when I use the German Bible, that's my reference. Why? Because it's really really close to the original text, um, and a lot of effort has has gone into the translation, not to make it easy on the ear, but to be as precise and as accurate as possible with reference to the to the original text. So in German, it sometimes sounds a little bit um, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't sound smooth and slick, but um, but it's very precise. So if you study the Bible and you really want to get into it, it's it's ideal. And and that was sort of the mentality at the time that uh, the Brethren movement in Germany they um, they just wanted to present the Word of God as precise and accurate as possible. And he was uh, a key figure of that. So I I owe Mr. Darby a lot. Because uh, when I first became a Christian, the Bible of choice was the Elberfelder Bible. And it took me a little bit of time to read my way into it, but, um, but I got it. By the way, very close to the Elberfelder Bible is the King James Bible, uh, the older, the authorized version. Uh, again, English is a little bit um, rough from today's perspective. It's not smooth and slick. Um, I'm sure if you lived in the 17th century, uh, it would have been a lot easier to understand since the uh, vocabulary in, in everyday life was a lot closer to the Bible translation than what it is today. Okay, um, right, what, what were these people saying? They said that this guy here, John Nelson Darby, he came up with this rapture theology. And and I, uh, sort of the stuff I've heard of him, and, and I... I think of him, I think he's a very deep Christian. He's a good Bible reader, he understands the Bible, he um, has got sound theology. Um, I, I don't, again, I don't know everything he has written, and I haven't gone into it. I, I just know a little bit about him, and what I know about him is, is very impressive. Okay, right, so these guys say he has done it, and that's the reason why we believe or why we have the rapture doctrine and why we believe that the rapture will take place. <clears throat> if you read the Bible without Darby's interpretation, um, we would never have the idea that there was anything like a rapture taking place. Um, right. <clears throat> so if we read the Bible without him, without this, this notion of the rapture, then we would never, you know, find it in the Bible. I mean, they say even the word rapture doesn't exist in the Bible, which is kind of true, and it isn't true. Um, in the Vulgate Bible, in the Latin translation, you would find the word rapturo. In the English Bible, you don't. It's You'll see in a minute the, 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 the words which have been chosen for that. Okay. The, the big question is now, did the church fathers, like the early uh, theologians which we had in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th century, um, did they believe in the rapture? Did they talk about it? Um, I've got some comments here, and so this looks at some of the, the ancient, uh, uh, the church fathers who were in the first half of the first millennium. And um, <clears throat> I'm just going to give you the URL. And um, so ancient church fathers believed in pre-trip rapture. Um, 
And then they've got, I'm just going to quickly go through this. So if you are on YouTube, let me just get rid of all these ads here. So if you are on YouTube, you may be able to pick up the uh, URL and check it out yourself. But uh, we've got a couple of names here. We've got Eusebius, um, Alexandrinos, or else have you got Clement of Rome, um, Hippolytus, Hippolytus, or Lytus. Uh, some of the names I recognize and I've been reading them. Some of them I don't, I have to, to say, but they talked about the rapture and there was this idea and this concept there. Um, okay. And there was a little bit, um, I was reading, I was skim quick reading through this text, there was a little bit of an anticipation that a rapture might take place. Uh, what we find in the first generation that uh, as Jesus ascended into, into heaven, there was a very strong expectation of the Lord's return within a generation. Um, and, and it wasn't unfounded as, as well. Uh, I mentioned this before many times here on, on YouTube that uh, I had the privilege of going to Pakistan and they, I, I went to a place which was called Taxila. And I went to a place where, where there was just a, they excavated an old village, and the rumor has it that John preached uh, that the apostle Thomas, that Thomas preached there. I mean, we know that Thomas went all the way to the south of of India, and they right if you go right to the south of India, there are church communities who claim that their <clears throat> that their origin is not through, you know, Catholic missionaries or Protestant missionaries, but it goes right all the way back to Thomas that he started the church there in southern India. And that, that, that this is our origin, and that's what, what these guys believe. Um, so in the first generation, they made great efforts, and as far as the known world is concerned, they probably reached most of the people in the first generation, and then it all stalled with persecution and um, you know lots of stuff that was going on in the Roman Empire. Um, but they probably had the justified expectation that, yeah, Jesus could come back because in Matthew 24, Jesus said that this gospel has to be preached to all nations and then the end will come. And, um, and there, there probably was this expectation. Now, what we find in the second, third and fourth generation, Jesus didn't come back. There was still sort of, uh, and we can see this here in this, these, um, um, th this article, which talks about this stuff. There was still... Um, um, people talking about the return of Christ, um, but it became less prevalent in the doctrine. So you had eschatology, like the teaching of the end times, and they probably had a lot of reason to, especially in the first generation, to, to think about this. When you look at Nero and some of the things he did, you would have thought this is the Antichrist, you know, that's him. And, and I'm convinced that Nero pretty much walked in the spirit of Antichrist, but obviously it wasn't him. Um, and, and obviously, some of the persecutions were really heavy, so uh, it would it would look like that. Okay, <clears throat> now I want you to I want to take you I want you to go with me through a journey, <clears throat> a journey through the Bible, uh, just to make the point, and and then judge yourself. You know, would you read a pre-trip rapture into the scriptures I've just I will be giving you in a moment. Um, <clears throat> Or would you um, would you not see this in it? And and to me, I mean, I, I don't know how <clears throat> anybody could come up and say it's not in the Bible. You know, if I didn't have John um, John Nelson Darby's interpretation, I would have never come to the idea that there's a rupture. I, I personally, I think it's as clear as anything. And a lot of passages in the Bible don't make any sense whatsoever if there there isn't a pre trip rapture or a rapture. You know, whether it's you know, pre-trip, mid-trip, or whatever, but the rapture for, for sure is there, is in the Bible. We're going to go through this in a minute. Also, I mean, one thing I want to I want to start off with is we've got the um, the end time run in the book of Revelation, which tells us where, where John has got a vision, and, and Jesus, through the Apostle John, tells us <clears throat> what will happen in the in the last days and how it, how it will all unfold. Um. When you look at the book of Revelation, I mean, elements of it are very clear and very open, but some elements of it are sort of kind of a little bit mysterious and uh, they need a, a key to unlock. There's quite a few things in the book of Revelation, 
no generation before us would have been able to understand it. Maybe, um, you know, TV set and telecoms and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> this, this would have been, uh, even my grandfather, I mean, he died in the, in the 80s. He was born in 1890, and he died in the 1980s. I think it was about 85 or 86 when he died. Um, my grandfather, he would not have been able to... Um, to understand, if he had read the book of Revelation, there, there were passages which wouldn't have made any any sense whatsoever. Uh, like, you know, a couple of guys die in Jerusalem and the whole world rejoices because they get the news and they send presents to one another. And then three and a half days later, they rise up and God takes them up and they rise up and descend into heaven. And it's all seen worldwide and people are freaking out about it. Um that wouldn't make any sense even in the 80s because you you didn't have internet connectivity, you didn't have um, a satellite connection, so people couldn't see, you know, stuff happening as it takes place. Today it's not a problem. I mean, if, um, you know, in 2023, uh, we have got internet connectivity, we have got broadband, we have got uh, social media and things like that, so if anything happens anywhere in, in the world, you can pretty much guarantee that... Um, if it's a big enough event that everybody will know about it within seconds. Um, that is the, the age we're living in today. And, you know, the mark of the beast, uh, big mystery today, you know, no mystery at all. Um, it, it can be done in various ways, but, you know, the ability to buy and sell unless you've got the mark of the beast, yeah, it's no problem. You, know, you look at chipping cats and dogs, um, Maybe humans will be chipped. Maybe it's some more sophisticated technology, uh, which will come up with the uh, you know as this uh, un unfolds. But um, but it's not a it's not a question at all, not a question at all. Now what I want to say is, and and I'm going to start off with this point. Um, when you look at the um, at the book of Revelation, the chapter two and chapter three, you've got the seven churches. And the seven churches are generally considered by, by most scholars to, number one, you know, refer to real churches and real problems that they had, but also re refer and relate to the age of the church and look at different periods of church. And today we can identify it very, very clearly. Um, just to give you a rundown, we have got Ephesus, we have got Smyrna, we have got Pergamon. So Ephesus, the first church, you know, first generation people on fire m most of the people who were around in that that generation they would have met Jesus Christ in person in the flesh or, or they would have known somebody who has met Jesus Christ in the flesh yeah so so that wasn't there then we've got um Smyrna Smyrna a, a church which the suffering of persecution we had about 300 years of heavy persecution and and just to make the point it hasn't stopped Smyrna churches to some extent are still around where, where people are persecuted to death in, in various countries for their faith. And um, this has been going on all the way. I mean, some people say that because of the increase in population and increase in Christianity, that there are more people persecuted today, more people being martyred than all the people taken together in history, all the Christians taken together in history. I, I don't know whether this is true, but uh, I can see that you know, with the, um, you know, what's happening in certain countries around the world. And, and what, what's happening to Christians and how they are murdered for the faith. faith. Um, then we have got Pergamon. Pergamon is um, the, um, you know, the not medieval church, but the church sort of starting about 500, where you've got the mixture of, um, of paganism and Christianity sort of melting together. Um, and, and again, we can see this where uh, the, the word and the church try to, to go together. Then we've got Thyatira, Sardis, uh, and I hope I get it right, Thad, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Yeah, so they are the four churches. So Thyatira is considered to be the Catholic church, maybe from medieval days, you know, crusades onwards, around about there. Um, we have got Sardis, you know, the, the church who's got the name to be alive but is dead. Uh, it's a Protestant church, the Protestant movement, you know, great stuff that was happening in those days, but but somehow they lost momentum very quickly, and today it's it's pretty much a dead church. And then we've got Philadelphia, the missionary church, which started kicking in about 1700s, 1800s, still around today, 
And then we've got Laodicea, you know, the, the people who say, we've got it all. We are full of it. Yeah. And, and yet they've got nothing. And, and Jesus is on the outside. And, and then, you know, when you look at the book of Revelation, it stops. There's no more church. It's not my church. And then you've just got the earth dwellers and you've got the saints, but you don't have church anymore. And that suggests that the dispensation of the church finishes in Revelation chapter 3. And, and when you look at it from a chronological point of view, and some people say you can't do this with the book of Revelation, I say maybe you can to some extent. But if you look at it from a chron chronological point of view, the church is finished. No more church. You've got saints, individual people who would, during the tribulation come to Christ and uh, surrender their heart to God, and, and they have to, to suffer quite heavily, and they're going to be exterminated by the Antichrist who can overpower them for a time until Jesus comes back. Okay, right, starting point. Now, whenever we look at the Bible, and there's this rule, you know, if you come up with a doctrine, you should at least find two places in the Bible which confirm one another or support one another, if you don't, you're on kind of dangerous ground. So there's one scripture which is just as plain as anything with the rupture, but there's another scripture which kind of points into it, and we're going to look at those scriptures in a minute. Now, the church fathers, they were talking about Enoch, and let me just go back to Genesis 5. And, and this is the first, the first moment, and it's just a little scripture here, and it's, it's sort of weird. It, it talks about um, the the godly seed of Adam. And um, it says here, Enoch lived 65 years, and it's just the genealogy of all the, the good people who were born through the line of Seth and not through the line of Cain. Uh, Abel didn't have a chance, so he was taken out of the equation pretty early, killed by Cain, and so Seth was um, pr producing the good line. And here we've got uh, Enoch, lived 65 years. Let me just go one day before. Jared, so that's Enoch's father, lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and he begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. So when you look at the genealogy, it's not very long. Um, <clears throat> it, everybody sort of lived the first godly day, but then died kind of just short of it. So 800, 900 years and so on. But Enoch, um, he was done at 365 years. And then here's the interesting statement. Let me just read this to you. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Okay. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So here was a man who was just walking with God. You know, like Adam and Eve in the, in the garden, um, they met God in the afternoon in the cool of the day and had time with him, had fellowship with him. And Enoch just went back to that. Despite all the sin and all the horror which had come into the world, Enoch just walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Generally, scholars understand it that, that he didn't die, but God just took him, you know, uh, with everything, full body, flesh, everything, and he went up to heaven, and he was with God. That is sort of the understanding people have. Uh, when I look at the Church Fathers, when you, if you go through this document, which I pulled up earlier, um, they talk about this as well, and they use this as, uh, you know, first reference of the rapture. You know, that uh, the walk with God will get you. And, and it's interesting as well, because when you look at this, um, then um, um, Methuselah was the oldest guy, and... Um, <clears throat> and after Methuselah died, the flood was going to come. Yeah, I think I got this right. Um, okay, so we've got Noah. Noah. So Methuselah was the granddad of Noah. Um, and I think if you translate the name, it's something like after after him the flood or something. Um, so 
so God was already preparing the judgment because the world had become wicked, and and then Noah was a chosen person to build the ark and to rescue mankind and creation. Okay, so anyway, I don't want to go too much into this, but uh, just stick with this one here. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Um, again, a big lesson here. It's, it's, it's interesting as well. We don't know anything about this guy, uh, other than we can tell a little bit by the names if you translate them into, into English from Hebrew. But um, <clears throat> but um, but he walked with God, and that, that is a statement. And, and, and again, you could make a sermon out of this. Um, I want you... You know, when you, I, I once went to a, a cemetery in, um, where was it, in Western Supermare, I think, yeah, <clears throat> not Western Supermare, it was, um, just trying to think of the name, north of Blackpool, can't think of the name, anyway, and I saw a graveyard, and there was uh, a gravestone, and it was written on it that it was a poet, and he wasted his life, and didn't do anything good, and that was the statement on his gravestone. Uh Obviously, somebody was whoever you know put this gravestone up was pretty pretty bitter about this guy, and and so they probably just gave him <laughs> even in his death a hard time. But uh, but again, um, um, let me just take one 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 go go one step further. I, I went to Paderborn, my my hometown, and and it's the same thing. There was um, um, there are lots of gravestones, and then sometimes people put something relevant. To that person's life on the gravestone. So there was one grave, <coughs> and you saw a train, aeroplane, the globe, and a ship. <coughs> so obviously, this was a a, 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 um, a family, or it was a husband and wife, and they did a lot of traveling, and that's what you could tell by the gravestone. There was another gravestone. It was near my my granddad's uh, grave, and uh, <coughs> the guy died sometime in the sixties, nineteen sixties, and they um, they put down that he. Um, Th that he was a conductor of a of an orchestra. Uh, I, I don't have a link to music to such a, such extent, but it was for them, you know, important enough to put this down that he was. Um, I don't know whether he was famous or or something. Maybe I should find out and work out about his name. His name, his dates are there, but but sometime in the sixties, sometime maybe he was quite old at the time when he died. But sometime in his life, he must have been a, a great musician, and that's what they stuck on the gravestone. And um, and again, with Enoch, all we know is he walked with God, and he was not for God took him. Yeah. And, and if, I mean, if, I'm not going to get there, yeah, because probably I've got too, much, too many days in my life where, where uh, my walk with God was a bit, um, a bit bumpy. Yeah. Uh, but, but to be fair, you know, this is something I would like to see, you know, if I don't get raptured, we're talking about the rapture, over my gravestone as well. And... Uh, uh, hopefully on yours as well, or, you know, the stump over your life that he or she walked with God. Uh, obviously, it would be nice to, to end up in the rapture and not to go through the turmoil of death, um, the gradual decline or, or whatever it is, or sudden decline, but, but to be taken up in the rapture and to be translated from this life into the eternal life. Okay, so that's... Um, um, Enoch. Church fathers were, were looking at this as well. Okay, next one is Elijah. Yeah? <clears throat> and Elijah ascended into heaven as well. So he didn't die. Uh, he came up straight into heaven. And it says here, and it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elijah from Gilgal. And Elijah, Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came, to, came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from, you, from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me onto the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on, 
And uh, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and uh, struck the water, and uh, it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I may do for you before I am taken away from you. Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as uh, they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more and took hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? When he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Okay. This is the story of Elijah taken up into heaven. Again, some kind of rapture, not the or the rapture, um, but it kind of points to what will happen to the church. Um, but still, I mean, based on those two scriptures, I, I wouldn't sit down and I would maybe agree with those guys and say, how can you derive a rapture you know, from those, those scriptures? But they point to something, and they point to something big. Okay, now the next scripture is a little bit more um, revealing, and this is when, when we've got the end time speech, uh, in Matthew 24. So this is all about the end times. And and when you read Matthew 24, I'm not going to go through all of it, otherwise it, this talk is going to get too, too long. But <clears throat> the big thing is about deception. There's going to be deception, deception, deception. And, um, and, and this is what Jesus is warning us for. But he says they would even deceive the elect if it were possible. The, the thing is, you've got the word of God and you've got the Holy Spirit. And whatever I tell you, yeah, I obviously in my in my heart, which is treacherous above all things, like your heart and everybody everybody else's heart as well. But um, I don't want to deceive you. Obviously, I want to give you the word of God. Yeah. But nevertheless, whatever you hear, even if people appear to be trustworthy, <clears throat> you should always um, check it, pray about it. And before you accept it, just just get peace from from the Lord about you know various doctrines as, as they may be presented to you, including this one as well. And I hope, obviously, I I, I hope uh, you can see it. But but this doctrine um, is not really it's not troublesome, <clears throat> even though you might think you know I don't know when I'm taken away from here. I've got kids. I've got a wife. I've got a husband. I've got um, I've got parents to look after. I've still got unsaved people in my family I need to present the gospel to. <clears throat> and you might not be ready to go, or you, you might not think that you're ready to go. You need, need more time, and it might not be comforting. But uh, it is meant to be comforting, that we'll be taken uh, before, you know, it gets all really, really bad here. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so he talks about it, and he says all the stuff that's going to happen, and then the big thing, you know, gospel being, being preached to all nations, and the end will come. And then he says something here, but about that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And, and obviously, for God, that's a choice. Yeah. As it was in the days of Noah, so it'll be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, given into marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen <coughs> until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. <coughs> One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is going. <coughs> uh, 
darkness. Um, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It'll be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. He then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master <clears throat> of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of, and he will cut him to pieces and, and assign him to the place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. Let me give you a little bit of an insight into or, you know, what I see in this, in this passage. So the first one is, um, it's about the end of times, yeah, the end of days. We've got the Great Tribulation, which is, which is told here, and you know, we are warned about false prophets. How do we recognize false prophets? We will recognize them by their fruit. We can tell by their fruits, you know, whether they are good or not. And fruits are not necessarily the number of followers they have or how big and successful their TV program is, but fruit is um, the fruits of the Spirit. You know, are they gentle? Are they loving? Are they kind? You know, is there the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their life? And I tell you one thing, when I look at some of the TV preachers, you know, it, it seems to be the bigger the name, um, the less fruit they, they have to show. And when you sort of dig a little bit deeper, it's sometimes horrible what you what you discover. So uh, don't be taken in by great names. Be taken in by Jesus Christ, the greatest name of all. And, um, and rather listen to the nobodies who love the Lord their God and have got some insight into the Word of God than to those big names who are just big showmasters on television and lead a lot of people astray. Anyway, <clears throat> moving on to this. Um, so what we what we have here is we've got a um, um, <clears throat> um, couple of things which are very important. We'll have the trumpet call, uh, the Son of Man coming on the clouds in the heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather the elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. And, and again, some of you could say, okay, this is... Um, <clears throat> This is the coming after the tribulation period. And it might be, you know, before the tribulation period where, where Jesus is, is, is not coming visible to the world, but he's only visible to those who love him. Yeah. And, uh, and there are indications that, that there are two events. Yeah. This one, you could interpret it in, um, in, in, in both ways. I think this particular scripture looks at the um, at the very end <clears throat> and um, and this is when when Christ comes back uh, when when the world is almost finished at the end of the tribulation period finished by the judgment of God and um, <clears throat> by the man who comes in his own name the Antichrist who was pretty much finishing off the world or doing his best to finish off the world himself okay um right <clears throat> And then we've got this bizarre stuff here. Yeah. And if you haven't got the rapture, how do you explain this? So two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, the other left. Why? Yeah. Who are these women? They're just people doing ordinary, everyday jobs. They're farmers. They are doing household work. Um, one will be taken, one will be left. Then we've got, therefore you keep watch because you do not know the day your Lord will come, but understand if the owner of the house... Okay, and there's an interesting thing as well. Um, you won't know the day, but you will pretty pretty much know um, <clears throat> uh, when Jesus will return. Uh, um, so we know that when the Antichrist makes a covenant with the people of Israel... Uh, the clock starts counting down, and then we've got seven years. But we know that Jesus has said that he will cut those days short, otherwise no flesh would survive. <coughs> so it's going to be seven years minus. <coughs> That's what we know. But about the rapture, <coughs> sorry for that. About the rapture, we don't know. We've got no idea whatsoever. 
<clears throat> it could be um it could be at any time really <clears throat> i mean some scholars um quoting chuck swindle uh, not chuck swindle chuck missler here <clears throat> and and his statement was that that there doesn't need to be any prerequisite for the rapture it could come at any time really um and um <clears throat> But we know about the, the Antichrist. The Antichrist cannot come at any time, but there need to be certain prerequisites met, um, like the nation of Israel and, and other stuff. Interestingly as well, when you look at Darby Nelson, uh, John Nelson Darby, um, he died in 1880. <coughs> His main theology <coughs> was developed sort of uh, 1830, 1850, 60s, around about there. But he made the statement that there will be a physical nation of Israel, and that God's promises will be um, will be be valid, and that the Jews will return to their to the homeland. There are lots of scriptures in the Old Testament which point this way, and and today, with the benefit of hindsight, we know it it, it happened. It started in about 1880, so that was about the time when when Darby died, uh, where they had the so-called Elias, and um, then the proclamation of the state of Israel was in 1948. In a day, a nation was born. <clears throat> Still there today, and, um, and again, a big, big requisite for for the end times as well. Darby could see this in the Bible, um, and there was no at the time when he was alive. There was no indication that this w would happen, that that there would that there was going to be a, a state of the Jews again in Jerusalem, in Israel, in the land of Israel. Okay. <clears throat> Um, the next scripture is the one with the, the ten virgins. Um, I'm going to let you read this for a moment. I need a glass of water or something. Um, otherwise my, my voice is just going. Just a moment. <coughs> <clears throat> Hopefully it worked a little bit better. So we've got the ten virgins as well, and it's a very scary verse. Um, I'm just going to paraphrase it. <clears throat> um, story of the bridegroom goes a bit into sort of Jewish customs. Um, the bride, the bridegroom goes and he prepares a room in his father's house. And uh, when the room is ready, <clears throat> he will go out to meet his bride. And uh, um, there's going to be a call, like a trumpet or something, you know, announcing the arrival of the uh, of the bridegroom. And then the virgins have to get ready, get dressed, and and come and follow the wedding party to the uh, to the groom's home and to the room he has prepared for for her. <clears throat> And there's a lot of imagery in this in this wedding feast, which is uh, for us as well. But what we find here, we've got the wise versions and the foolish versions. The wise versions, they had oil uh, to keep the lamps burning to see where they were going. And the foolish ones didn't. They were sort of half there and uh, not really prepared. Um, and then there's a bit of a ua, and then the wedding party starts. Uh, because the, the foolish versions have to go back to get some more oil and to lose time and by the time they come back to the to the banquet banquet to the banquet um it is uh, it is all happening and when they knock on the door they say who are you what do you want here okay um how shall we interpret this i mean i i <clears throat> some people say you know if you are a lukewarm christian or you know you're messing up or whatever um and i don't know what the answer is to be fair i'm not 100 percent sure that the way I reconcile it to myself, these scriptures, is, is the right way, but I'm just telling you what I think. Um, 
so if you're not sort of um, in German, we've got this expression Feuer und Flamme. So it's fire and flame for the Lord. Like if you're not really into the Lord and, and really committed and, uh, uh, you know, given, sold out for Jesus, you're not going to make it. You're going to stay here through the tribulation time. Personally, I think because the dead in Christ rise first, and it's not just the dead who, um, you know, were fire and flame, but also those who were saved and justified and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, but um, but they um, may not have lived a, a great life. They may have, you know, tried, tried but didn't quite make it, you know, in living holy and sanctified lives. But um, personally, I believe, and this is just my belief, that, that everybody who is in Christ Jesus, everybody who is born again, everybody who is being washed by the blood of the Lamb, everybody who is right with God, you know, through Jesus Christ, will, um, will be going. But I believe that there are, that there are and, and, and this is sort of, uh, took me a long time to sort of try and understand this, but I think when I look at the, the body of Christ, at Christians, evangelical Christians or, you know, people who call themselves Christians, that there are a lot who are religious. They don't really know Jesus. They don't want to know him because uh, the consequence could be to die. So instead they pursue some sort of religiosity. And so they're kind of there, but they're not really there. They've never broken through. They've never been cleansed of their sins. They aren't right with God, and and I think this is as well. Like, just imagine there, there's a bridegroom, there's a bride. If you love your bridegroom, uh, you make sure that you've got plenty of oil. If you if you understand, you know, the process of what's going on, you make sure that you're okay. But if you if you're just sort of religious and you are neither here nor there, uh, you may have never broken through. You may not know him. You may not have the Holy Spirit in your life. I believe if you've got the Holy Spirit in your life, which you will have if you come to um, um, a, a point in your life where you really break through, where you repent and where you say, your will be done, not mine, and you really, really mean it, and, uh, and where you accept what Jesus Christ has done for you, that he has paid for all your sins, and that you totally and utterly rely on him and not on yourself. If you've come to this point in your life, then you will um, you will be one of the wise virgins, you know, full of oil in your lamp and not the foolish versions who are kind of you know meddling playing with Christianity but never really broke through they don't really know the groom they don't really know they don't really know what to think of him or what's happening they're kind of there sitting on the fence but they haven't jumped over yet um, so I believe that when the the rapture comes there will be a lot of people who will be called Christians who have never broken through, and um, and it will not make it. I, th I think the same thing as well is when when you go into eternity, and you see, you know, on the other side, what's really going on. I mean, Augustine said you will be surprised who you find in heaven, but you will also be surprised who you won't find in heaven, um, and, and there will be surprises all the way around, you know, on both sides, and um, and. Um, I think when you look at some scriptures it says which which talk about you know work on, on your salvation with fear and and I think that there should be some sort of healthy fear you know of God to uh, work on your salvation and your calling before God which I think you know this this is talking about this my understanding of the scripture is that, that this is a rupture and it's pointing to the rupture it is not, you know, when Christ is coming back and he's rejecting people, but it's a rapture. There are some people which are going to be snatched away and there's going to be a great party in heaven when, when all this is done. The church is completed. The dispensation has been fulfilled. Everything is happening. When you look at the next parable, it's, it's similar as well. You get like, um, you know, people who have been really into, you know, what God wanted them to do. Uh, they've been following their calling, you know, and this is like talking about these... Um, the parable with the bags of gold, you know, that people are giving bags of gold and and some of them, you know, they, they've got this gold and they start working with it and multiply it and one of them says, right, I'm just going to bury it. Uh, the interesting thing as well is it's it's, a, it's one of those weird parables which, which initially they don't make sense, but when you look in, into it, yes, they do make sense because you find these people. And this guy, what he was saying is, I mean, he could have said, look, you know, 
I'm I'm useless, and um, I was afraid to, you know, do something with this bag of gold. But I I I would lose it, and I couldn't face it. And and that's here, yeah, you know, I'm giving it back to you. I try to keep it safe, but I didn't multiply because I'm I, I'm just not up to it. He could have said this, but he said no. I know that you are a harsh master. That you uh, harvest where you haven't sown, and um, that you um, um, it's here harvesting where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. And I was afraid and went out and hit your gold. Yeah. So he knew exactly what he was supposed to do, and and he refused to do it. He rebelled. Now, obviously, this guy, and I think this points to the to the foolish virgins. This guy wasn't with his master. He wasn't with him. He he knew about him, but he just wanted to do his own thing. He wasn't bothered about multiplying gold because he thought, you know, it's just for him anyway, nothing for me in it. Yeah. And there, there are, this is mentality, and I find this, especially in this Laodicea generation, that there are a lot of people who come to Christ for what they can get out of it. I, I know one lady, and I'm not sure what's happened to her, I've lost, lost track. She couldn't cope with life. She had depressions, and it was really, really difficult. She went through a, a nasty divorce, and and nothing was really right in her life. And, and she she said it quite openly that she came to church because she knew that, um, you know, she was going to find help and she was helped. And when she's okay again, then she would leave. And you think that's not the attitude. You know, if you, if you come to Christ, you come to Christ because you love him for who he is, for who God is. And, um, and you define your existence out of your relationship with God and not out of what can I get out of him? And once I've got it, I'm off. Um, and, and this is what this guy was doing. He, he just wasn't interested. He didn't, he didn't want to know. And so he, he went. But again, just uh, the virgins. And we've got you know this, this theme which goes along here at the end of Matthew 24 and 25. Okay, let's go to Luke. Luke 21 is also the end time, um, also the end time um, talk, narrative, the same as Matthew 24, slightly different, um, different angle, bearing in mind they're different um, writers here, they've seen, heard the same story, but they may sort of zoom into different elements. Okay, and here it says uh, in, in the end time speech, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Okay, what is this all about? That you may be able to escape all that is to happen. And again, even though it's not, you know, spelling out rapture, but it points into this direction. The same as, you know, one will be taken, the other one will be left behind. Yeah. So it's another scripture which kind of, a little bit cryptically, but not that cryptic, uh, points to the rupture. And uh, that he may be able to stand before the Son of Man. How do we stand before the, the Son of Man? How are we able to do it? It's number one is, is seeking forgiveness of sin, putting our trust in him. Uh, living a life of repentance. It's very, very important. Repentance, not being miserable about your sin, but changing your mind, changing your mentality to the way God wants your mind to be and to allow him to work on you, to work in your heart, work on your mind and to walk the good way and not the bad way, to do the things God wants you to do and not the things the world wants you to do. And they are very, very different, very different. God's economy is very different to, to the world's economy. Uh, another another um, uh, sermon or, or talk about this, but uh, very different. Yeah, the leader is the servant of all. That's that's Christianity. You're not the big guy, but you are the little one. You know who serves them all, who helps them all. The humble person is the greatest, not the one with the big mouth. But that's God's economy. But here, escape all that is about to happen. And he talks about the end time. Yeah. And and he warns us as well, you know, don't get drunk and, you know, be trapped with the anxieties of life. Um, for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth, the earth dwellers. We are not earth dwellers. We are citizens of heaven, uh, ambassadors of Christ sent down here on earth. That is really our status. Um, and, uh, and be on watch and pray that we will be able to escape what is about to happen. So it's a, a clear call to do it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe not everybody, you know, who is a, a born-again Christian who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, who uh, has got relationship with Jesus Christ and knows him, uh, but he's got a bad day, 
maybe he will be left behind. I don't believe this. Yeah, I think there's a different perspective on it, but I don't know. Yeah, proof is in the pudding. Yeah, if 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 one day I wake up in the morning and everybody is gone and I'm still here, uh, then I know I was wrong. Um, I was wrong, and I have to go through the uh, the hardship of the tribulation period. Um, but this is what we should do: is watch and pray. Yeah. And I tell you one thing, watch and pray more than ever before because we are very, very close. What you see happening all around us, the convergence of all the signs which are in the Bible pointing towards the end, uh, the, the the labor pains, you know, the birth pangs or birth pains, um, you know, as, as we are going through time and they're getting closer and closer together, it's happening, it's there, it's here. It's just a question of time. Okay, let's go on with the rapture talk. Right, now we're coming closer to... Um, to the rapture talk, and um, and and Paul talks about the uh, the resurrection. Yeah, um, I'm just looking right. And this is I'm start reading from verse fifty. This is uh, let me just go through it. First Corinthians chapter fifteen, and then verse fifty. Uh, and he says, See, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does a perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery or secret. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flush, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been closed with the imperishable and mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Okay, so what is Paul talking about here? And, and it, from what I read into here and what I see, and you could still make the argument those guys made and said, look, if you read the Bible and you, you haven't heard about the rapture doctrine, you won't find it in the Bible. Uh, it's slightly cryptic, but it's pointing to it. It's pointing to the event. So, so far, we've just been looking at, at, at scriptures, more obvious or less obvious, which point to this one event, which is the so-called rapture. Okay, we've got two more scriptures to look at, and um, and one of them is, is just as clear as anything. Uh, if you discard the rapture as a, as a legitimate doctrine, you would have to literally take a, a rubber and rub out this one scripture we're going to look at in a minute. But all the others are just in support of this one scripture, and I haven't considered them to be the second witness to validate and verify what Paul is saying in that scripture and you know justify the doctrine of the rapture based on that. Okay, we're going to go to the next one, and uh, let's have a look. Um, so again, talks about the Antichrist. Um, and, you know, don't be unsettled because certain things must happen. Um, so the man of lawlessness has to rise up and uh, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. A couple of things which are there. Now, Paul in Paul's day, the temple was still around. Probably at the time when he was written it, it was destroyed in 70 AD. Um, everything... Everybody is ready to to get the temple back up again, and he will set himself in the temple. And this is, you know, a little bit of a um, a pointer that, um, yeah, the time is is very very close at hand. You know, Antichrist is ready to set himself set himself up in in God's temple, and to let him be called himself, be called God, and worshipped as God. It's happening. It's there. I, it's, when you look into it, there's a temple institute in Jerusalem. Uh, they're looking at the red heifer, you know, to um, start the initiation of the temple. And all this is in, in process and it's happening. Okay, now hear the scripture, which is important. Don't you remember when I was with you, I used to tell you all these things. And now you know what is holding him back so that it may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then lawless, the lawless one, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Okay. So, I don't want to go any further. Um, the lawless one is hemmed back. 
is pushed back, is holding him back. Um, and the one who holds him back will do so until he is taken out of the way. And um, personally, I believe it's the Holy Spirit. How is the Holy Spirit here on earth? He's here on earth through the church. And it's revealed in the church and in individual believers. And we are sort of the salt of the earth, you could say, or the light in this world to give people a little bit of direction, a bit like Lot. He was a light in Sodom, a city that was completely depraved and ready for judgment. But there was still one righteous man who could see right from wrong. And, um, and he was holding back lawlessness, I'm sure, at the time, to some extent. And so the church, or the Holy Spirit, is revealed through the church. The church is taken away, all the believers are taken away. Um, the Holy Spirit is taken away, and then the, the, the floodgates open, and, and evil can spread over the globe. Okay, still, you know, it has to be taken away, yeah, taken out of the way. So what does this mean? taken out of the way, points to the rapture uh, very, very strongly. So something happens and woof, gun. Um, and we've seen this before in Corinthians. It's the believers, yeah? the last trumpet, woof, dead in Christ rise, then we who are left behind will be taken up. We will be changed. That's what it says. We will be changed. Okay. Right. Now Paul picks up on this again in First Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. I need to tell you the other scripture. That was Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse five onwards, and now we're going to go to First Thessalonians chapter four. And he says, "Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's, Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive." who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the arch arch archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and after that we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore encourage one another with these words. Okay, the doctrine of the rapture, this is a point. Encourage. You know, uh, I was, uh, how long ago? It's about a year ago, I buried my mother. And, and one of the statements is, is uh, the coffin is now lowered into the grave and there's his body, uh, her body in the coffin. Um, I know she was a Christian and she loved the Lord. And, um, and the message I could give is, I could say that there will be the day when this, this trumpet call of God comes and that the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive will be caught up together. And so literally, that body that is in that grave, buried with lots of soil, stuck on top of it. Uh, I don't know how much it is. I guess it's a couple of tons in weight. But, um, but that body will, will shoot through this soil, earth, and will be transformed into a glorious resurrection body and perfection. But Paul says in Corinthians, we... Um, <clears throat> we are and we die in mortality, but we will be raised in immortality. There will be a perfect body with full regenerative powers, with uh, no potential for sickness, but uh, it'll be raised in perfection. And that is really, you know, what we should encourage one another with, and probably the greatest verse we can quote at a Christian's funeral. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the day when this happens. It should be an absolute amazement. The time afterwards, not so much, because we've seen in the scripture before, the Holy Spirit is going to be taken away, and then the evil one can dominate. He can deceive the people, and he can, you know, God will send the people delusions to believe this guy, and they will uh, find their fate in rejecting him. Okay, I'm in rejecting God. You know, that's, that's the thing. The gospel is being preached to all nations at that point. People don't want to know about God, and now they have to suffer the consequence. Uh, I'm convinced, and this is from the book of Revelation, that people will still come to know Christ, and there will be um, uh, the saints, different type of setup, I think, the so-called saints, but they will be hunted down and persecuted, 
and the devil is going to try to get rid of them uh, through his man, the Antichrist, the man doomed to destruction, the man of perdition. But uh, we will be at the party, like the five virgins who, who made it. We will be at the party, we will have a great time. We will celebrate the righteousness of God, the grace of Christ, and uh, that we made it, that we can be with him. Um, once all this mortal flesh is gone, and we address an immortality, and there's no more imperfection inside of us or on us, just imagine, you know, especially women out there, you will have the perfect body, uh, absolutely perfect, no flaw, no nothing. It'll be perfect. Um, um, so this is something to look forward to, and this is something which is great, and it'll not be taken away from you. It'll be there forever. And you will rejoice in the goodness of God to you and to everybody else. Okay, I'm going to finish on this note. I hope this clarifies the rapture. Um, I would say when I look at the Bible and when I look at the scriptures which, which relate to, to the rapture, um, it's a close case. The rapture is going to happen. Personally, I believe it's going to happen before the tribulation. doesn't mean that prior to the rapture we don't have to go through hard times. I uh, just want to remind you that there are Christians in China who are persecuted. There are Christians in the Islamic countries, who some of them will suffer beheading or have suffered beheading in recent years. Um, Christians are now being persecuted in the West, you know, because we don't go along with the um, various agendas which are pushed stronger and stronger. Um, so there's persecution taking place in the West as well. People getting arrested for saying the wrong words. And um, it's just a reminder. So it's not, it's not going to be honky-dory. Persecution is going to be there. But I tell you one thing, when uh, the Holy Spirit is taken from this planet uh, and it may be only found inside of the saints, but not, you know, the peace of God is, is just taken away, I, I wouldn't want to be here. It's going to be absolutely horrendous. When there's no more restraint inside of people and they just do whatever they want to do, where sin has got free reign, is going to be a horrible place to be. So, if you don't know Jesus Christ and you're listening to this talk, I would just like to encourage you to really, to really, really go for, go for it. Um, again, there's not a formula or anything like that. I, I wouldn't give you a prefabricated prayer, and after the prayer, everything is okay. Um, just to make the point, you know, we are sinners before God. Nobody is righteous before God. All of us. We are just as rotten sorts as, 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 as can be. We need, number one, is forgiveness for who we are. And uh, we need to be willing to live the life God wants us to live. Understanding that we can't do it under our own steam, but we need God to uh, give us the strength and the power to do so. Uh, at the same time, you know, just to make it clear, you have to go towards a life of always turning away from the bad stuff and turning towards God. And this is not a one-off exercise that's going to happen till the day you die. Um, and so that's really the thing. But but on the other side, it's the most exciting thing you will experience in, in your life as you, as you change your direction and you invite Jesus Christ into your life. You put your faith and trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins. And you... Um, you accept him as your Lord and Savior, and you allow him to lead and guide you through this life. And there's nothing more exciting, there's nothing more peaceful, there's nothing more healthy, there's nothing more, uh, uh, how shall I say, meaningful than, you know, running into the arms of your Savior and being kept and held by him very safely. And you will find that that would be just an amazing time for the rest of your life. I, I became a Christian when I was 16 years old. Uh, I had a pretty rotten life before, uh, not much. Uh, I think the damage I could do, I only had about three years to do the damage. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful that God pulled me out early enough. But, um, but when I look back at my life from a worldly perspective, you know, certain elements have been successful. 
And people would say, yeah, you said a success, but there were also certain elements where, from a worldly perspective, they weren't successful at all, you know, where people would say I'm a complete failure, and I had to listen to this as well. But um, from my perspective, I had a great time. Even when times were hard and tough, uh, I could see with hindsight that God has been pushing me through, and things were just great, things were good, and uh, uh, I, d I don't look back. I'm really grateful that God has, has taken me out out of this world into his kingdom. So I want to invite you into the kingdom of God through the grace of Christ. Come to Jesus, you know, ask him today silently in your heart or speak out loud and say, Jesus, I want to know you. Jesus, please reveal yourself to me. Have mercy on me. I believe that you have died for my sins, that you have shed your blood for, for my sins and that I can be made right with God through what you have done on the cross that you have died as a substitutionary sacrifice for me. Please forgive me, forgive my sins, and, and make me right with God. I, I want you in my life. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. Please come into my life tonight. And if you have prayed this, or you're going to pray this, just uh, open your heart to him and, uh, and watch and be, some, be amazed and be surprised. It's going to be great. God bless and bye-bye from Michael here at Seismic Radio. Um, been a privilege to do. I'm not sure how long I've been on. Not longer than what I planned to, but I thought it was quite an important thing. I think we're very close to, to the rapture. Time will tell. <laughs> if, you, if you see this on the other side of the rapture uh, and you hear this talk, if it's still around, um, don't lose hope. You know, the, the most important thing is don't take the mark of the beast. Don't take, you know, if they're trying to stick stick some identifying mark on your forehead or your right hand, uh, don't do it, don't accept it. And um, and seek Jesus Christ. There's, there's still hope for you. He will lead and guide you through this time. And if, if you need to suffer martyrdom, don't worry about it. He'll be there right with you. But uh, whatever you do is don't, don't follow the... Don't follow the great leader that will be there and that seemingly has got all the answers. He hasn't. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. So you need to uh, you need to make sure that you stick with Jesus more than ever before if you're on the other side of the rapture. If you're on this side of the rapture, come to Jesus before it's too late. Be worthy to escape all these things. Be counted worthy to escape all these things. Okay, God bless and bye-bye. From Michael here at Seismic Radio.